presentation so that we can share this presentation widely um, after the fact. And I'm also going to set up our auto transcription and turn on one more feature. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Ann Graham and I'm with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. And welcome back to those participants who joined us last season um, or have joined us for many, many seasons. This is our second year of doing these workshops virtually. Um, normally these workshops would be done in a number of demonstration gardens around the Tahoe Basin and Truckee area. However, because of COVID last year, we transitioned to the virtual format. And this year um, to ensure the safety of our community members, but to be able to continue to share the passion for gardening with the community, um, we're maintaining our virtual format and platform. But tonight we have a really, really special presenter, Heather Adams, and a little bit from myself as well. Um, we'll be talking mostly about organic gardening um, from Heather, and then I'll be speaking a little bit about watershed health and how that is important in gardening, especially as fertilizers are used in our gardening practices. So a few housekeeping things before we get going on Heather's presentation. Like I said, this is the first gardening workshop of our series. Um, you can register for the following workshops on potatoes, kale and lettuce and chard, beans and peas, strawberries, tomatoes, and herbs at the Slow Food Lake Tahoe website. And I'll be sharing the link at the end of the presentation for those of you that are interested or still need to register for any of those workshops you're interested in. Different than last year, to help our program be a little bit more self-sustaining. The starter plants associated with those following workshops are actually going to be $10 for each workshop, but you will be getting a bountiful garden full amount of starter plants with each of those workshops. So we're uh, very excited to bring you some of the same varieties as last year, if you participated last year or some new varieties as well. But tonight on May 4th, May the 4th be with you. We're gonna be starting off with organic gardening. And just to make sure you all have the best viewing pleasure of our workshop here, if in your upper right-hand corner, you may see a couple different uh, view options. I'll be spotlighting different uh, speaker cameras throughout the presentation. So hopefully it allows you to most easily see what the speaker or presenter is focusing on. But in the upper right-hand corner, if at any point you can change uh, the view to speaker view so you can just see the speaker rather than all of the other participants who may or may not have their cameras on or off during our presentation here. Additionally, we'll be using the chat function for our question and answer session. So at the bottom of the screen, here there's a small chat box. You can click on that and it'll pop up a dialogue box like this and you can type any questions you have in the chat. Uh, make sure that those messages are going directly to me and Graham because I'll be compiling those for Heather to be answering um, as well as if there are any questions for me um, during the Q&A period but she won't be reading them so make sure you're sending them directly to Anne Graham. And then additionally, we have a new feature in Zoom that we're actually testing out. So I'm hoping that it's gonna be a helpful feature, but there are live transcriptions of uh, Zooms now. So in the bottom panel as well, if you click on the up arrow where it says live transcript and you can click view full transcript, it'll pop open a box on the right where you can read along um, as to what the presenter is saying as they are speaking. It's not a totally perfect method. Um, I think they are in the process of rolling it out, but we're hopeful that it'll make our programming more accessible to those who are willing and wanting to participate. But that's all I have on housekeeping things. Make sure any of those questions are coming directly to me in that chat, like I said, but Without further ado, we have Heather Cullen, who is presenting to us this evening. And Heather is a super phenomenal person. She's so knowledgeable. She has a background in soil science, so she is definitely the best person to be speaking to us about how to work with those tough Tahoe soils. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Heather so she can take us off on our organic gardening journey. Thank you, Anne. Just a quick little housekeeping thing. My overhead camera thing, for some reason, it kicked me off. I don't know if you can override that or not, but 
I don't know. Um, I can kind of improvise if I have to, but my overhead camera is suddenly, even though we practice, is not working. It looks uh, like you still have the two cameras in logged in. So um, I'll comes, have to look at it if you when wanna. it comes to time, just maybe prioritize the other one and then we can make it work. Sweet. Sounds All good. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me tonight. I am so excited to be here and um, teaching you this workshop is one of my favorite things to do in the spring. Um, so let me just share my screen with you. Can we, can we, there we go and start the presentation. Here we go. All right. So organic gardening 101. So we are essentially kind of like Anne explained a group of people with master gardeners. So Food Lake Tahoe, UC Davis and the Tahoe Heritage, Heritage Foundation. And we were, we're figuring this all out uh, in the virtual world. And this is year two. So we've kind of got a little bit more experience now. <laughs> yeah, we're not just throwing it together. So my name is Heather Adams, Heather Cullen. I've got a multiple of last names, but um, Heather Adams is my newest one. Um, I What qualifies me, I am a UC Davis Master Gardener. I got my certification last year. I also um, was on the board for Slow Food Lake Tahoe for many, many years. I helped establish the community garden there and created a lot of the funding available to make it what it is today. I also run my own company called Tahoe Integrated Landscape Consulting, where I, can, where I do soil testing and all kinds of fun um, assistance to people who want to start their garden, some kind of essentially kind of like a garden coach. And that's what I do for a living. So, you know, all kinds of good stuff. And I have loads of experience in all kinds of Tahoe gardens. I've been gardening in Tahoe for over 20 years. And I've learned some, I've failed enough to kind of help us all on this process. <laughs> So organic gardening 101, what is organic gardening? Essentially, it's a holistic approach to gardens and landscapes. Um, we, we wanna use all these synthetic fertilizers. Like long before industrial revolution, we, there was no such thing as petroleum-based um, fertilizers. So everything that we used to grow things was organic. But once industrialization came and we learned how to use all of these chemicals to manipulate and create these, these huge quantities of food, we didn't quite realize the, the, the detrimental side of that until later on. So in like the 60s and 70s, we kind of decided that we needed to get away from these chemicals that were kind of causing problems and making our food not quite so nutritious. So organic is essentially kind of using um, these original methods where we kind of cultivate the health of our soil and use the ecosystem around us to help create a healthy environment and more nutritious food for all of us. And this is a strawberry I grew in my garden last year. It's perfect <laughs> and I love it. So what do plants need to grow? So it seems pretty obvious and really simple when you break it down as sun, water, soil, and air. You're like, oh, it's just four things, super easy. But as we, kind of look a little bit further into it, it's a lot more complicated than that. So in Tahoe, number one is sun. Sun is something that we have plenty of in the summertime, sometimes too much. Um, and sun is what directly drives photosynthesis. It's essentially, sun, the plants have this incredible power that they're able to take the sunlight and synthesize it with carbon dioxide and water and oxygen and as a byproduct and create carbohydrates to eat. Could you imagine if all we had to do is sit out in the sun and we could create food? That's what plants do. And I think that that's so cool. <laughs> and it's, um, it's such an evolutionary thing that just bl always blows my mind. <laughs> so the things to make really, to kind of get in perspective here when you are thinking about sun in respects to your garden is really what's important is what aspect are you gardening? Um, and you wanna kind of plant plants according to that aspect. So south facing tends to be really warm, hot, it gets like really great strong sun. So you wanna use kind of those warmer plants, tomatoes, peppers, squashes, squashes. Um, but south facing can be really, really scorching as well. So you wanna kind of be careful um, you know, with making sure your plants have plenty of water and, you know, they, 
they don't you don't overdo it with them because sometimes it can be too intense north facing you know we can all kind of living in the mountains we all think that the north face is kind of a little bit chillier but it's true in our gardens too so cooler crops tend to do better like collard greens kale spinach um i know my parsley is always really happy in the north kind of cooler parts of my garden so you really want to plant according to what aspects you have where and essentially if you're kind of just starting out gardening what you want to do is make a note start taking notes where is the sunlight in your yard in your garden during certain point, points of the day is your, like all of a sudden you watch it for a couple of days you're like oh like it's sunny in this corner of the garden in the morning and it's shady in the afternoon or vice versa or like this part of the garden gets sun all day and then you can kind of really start to cultivate what plants you put where because they'll be able to kind of utilize that microclimate a lot easier and that's really important in understanding what the sun is doing in your garden and the sun the thing that makes it so difficult here in tahoe is that we have the biggest temperature differentials pretty much in the entire country um, in the summertime it's often 40 degree difference between midday and early morning so that's a huge temperature change and essentially, if you kind of, if you think about plants as like this big chemical reaction that happens and you're kind of constantly trying to manipulate that chemical reaction, chemical reactions happen quicker when it's warmer. So when it gets cold at night, that chemical reaction slows down and we're kind of trying to equalize that. So, you know, during the day it's creating tons of photosynthesis, plants are going crazy and then like there's this huge shift at night when it cools down and they're like slow right down and then it takes a bunch of time for it to come back up. So one of the things that we can do to kind of minimize that temperature differential is we can use raised beds and we can use cold frames. And here's some pictures of some cold frames down here. Cold frames are essentially raised bed greenhouses with lids. And this really extends the growing season here in Tahoe because you can, you can use them to help keep the temperature differential from going through those drastic changes. The number one thing you have to remember is they need venting. So in the warmest parts of the day, they have to be open. And like this one over here is kind of like the one that we have in the demonstration garden. We have a couple of them and they have a passive mechanism in them, which is so cool. Essentially the mechanism inside the hinge is made of wax. So in the hot part of the day, it melts and it opens. And then in the cool part of the evening, it solidifies again and it closes. And it's, you don't need electricity, you don't need anything and it just opens and closes all on its own. You don't have to remember. But you can use, you know, you know, kind of old windows, different pieces of plexiglass, all kinds of stuff to kind of create a cold flame, but you have to be aware of this venting. Uh, cold frames. <laughs> Water. So water here in Tahoe is always in short supply. And you really should have irrigation. I didn't garden with irrigation for many, many years. And you have to spend 20 to 30 minutes every day watering your garden. And it's never enough. It's, you know, I would always come home from work and I would see my plants like all wilted and like sad. And I'd be like, no. And I'd get out the hose and I'd start watering it. The great thing about having irrigation is you don't have to worry about that because your plants are gonna get watered, which is fantastic. And you can spend your time in your garden kind of looking for pests, making sure other things are going properly, you know, kind of deadheading, you know, you, you get to spend more time with your plants if you're not always worried about them having enough water. So I highly, highly re recommend getting an irrigation system. Drip irrigation works the best here, and it is the most efficient um, because, as you know, we are all kind of water wise, you know, we're kind of in a super drought, so, you know, we don't want to waste it. Um, the, my game changer here was this thing that I got. Boom, it's a rain bird. Um, and this mechanism here isn't even crazy expensive. And this part right here is a filter. I have hard water at my house, so this kind of helps kind of keep the buildup out of the, this mechanism and it senses when it's going to rain and it doesn't water when it rains you this dial you can do different durations for different times a day and 
runtime, how often it goes, it's the best. And I kind of keep it, you know, I can turn, I turn it down in the spring, in the fall, when it's a little bit cooler and I turn it up in the heat of summer and it's just turning a button and it's great. The pain in the butt part of the irrigation system is the setting up of the drip. And I just would say it takes a lot of patience <laughs> and um, you kind of have to go around and there's like a lot of tubes and there's a lot of fittings and it's just kind of a big puzzle. I usually take a, you know, a day or so and just kind of commit to working on my irrigation system when I could go to set up my garden. And, you know, I'm just setting up my garden now. I don't have my irrigation set up right now. It'll probably be, be um, several weeks before I do because it, it doesn't, you know, this time of year, it's actually relatively easy for me to hand water the stuff that's coming up already. So I just kind of do that. And then as, as I start to add more stuff to it, I'll set up my irrigation and have it going. So there's a couple of other things that were that if you're not going to have irrigation, and that's why I have these wine bottle pictures right here. So essentially, like I always have a few pots like out front of my house or somewhere that I can't loop into my irrigation system. So any kind of bottle that has a lid that you can poke holes in can work really well as kind of like a self irrigation thing. So um, essentially you just, I, you just need to poke a hole in here. Like I usually do three holes here at the top. You fill it full of water, you turn it upside down and you stick it in your pot. I really like to use wine bottles because I think they're pretty, but you can use milk jugs, soda bottles, anything like that. I've used a wide variety of stuff in desperation in times when I realize I'm leaving for a few days and I need to water my plants. So that's kind of like a good way to do it. On to my favorite part, <laughs> the soil. It's the most important part of your garden. The health of your soil will reflect the health of your plants. You know, you can go out and kind of get whatever soil you want, but realize that like you might not have good results if you're not paying attention to what your what is in your soil, how where it came from, what's in it, how it's going to work. Like you really need a diverse set of conditions for your soil to be really healthy. So the main parts are water, mineral, the mineral composition, which is the sand, silt, and clay, and you need air because there's no air, the roots have nowhere to go, and organic matter. And within that organic matter, there is microbes and fungi and macro stuff like worms, nematodes, stuff like that. So you need a combination of all these things in order for your soil to be productive. And the key to having really good soil is creating a diverse soil composition. It's a thriving medium for your plants. It's an ecosystem unto itself. It, that is what makes your soil super healthy. And I add all kinds of stuff to my soil all the time because I'm just trying to build up that microclimate within the soil. Like I want as much microorganisms, macroorganisms, stuff like that, like just thriving in my soil all the time because then my plants are going to thrive. It's a very, very important. So what does this mean for Tahoe soils? The soils in Tahoe are really immature which I know sounds kind of weird, but they're 20,000 years old. That was when our last glaciation was here. And in soils terms, that's, those are tiny little babies because it takes a really, really long time for soil structure and, and development to really happen for it to be like really rich. It doesn't help either that we are essentially in this very arid climate. We're essentially living in a desert. It really slows the development of soil down. So the fact that they're young, the fact that there isn't a long growing season, all that stuff, it really slows down soil development. It makes our soils really lacking in what plants need. <laughs> and that's why like, we don't have like a big lush forest here. It's more of like chaparral, deserty, sagebrush, because these are the plants that have adapted to not having a lot of nutrients and not a lot of water. Um, so that makes challenging it really challenging here. Um, that's why I really, if you're going to grow crops and you're trying to grow food, raised beds is really the way to go. It increases the overall temperature of the soil earlier in the season. So you can start planting early. You can, it allows you to really manipulate that soil, um, for growing and it helps with pest control, um, both macro pests and micro pests. Um, and 
the number one thing I can tell you that's going to help your garden is to mulch, mulch, mulch. There's a few things that don't need mulch, but that's those are the exception, not the rule. But mulch and mulch in the spring, mulch in the fall, and kind of help keep what's there there. The moisture, the organic matter, all that stuff is you're constantly trying to get enough organic matter in your soil. Um, it helps increase the water retention. Um, it helps protect your plants. It decreases weeds and it just really helps everything overall. Like I don't never really, I always mulch and there's all kinds of different mulches. We're going to talk about that here in this little soil demo. Um, so let me see if we can get my And do you see my my overhead camera working? I do. And I am going to spotlight it. Yes, here they are. Do you want me to keep sharing your slides or do you can I stop sharing so you can have the yes, samples? Stop, stop sharing so we can kind of look at this in the in the big frame. Okay. There we go. Take it away. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Ann. Um, my technical expert. Thank you. So um, here we have the right major here. kind of soils that we see in Tahoe Gardens. Um, and these are just super broad categories that I just kind of came up with. And of course, there's a million other different kinds. And this is just like really broad. So we can kind of understand what we're using, what we need, and like all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to start here with your average Tahoe soil. So this guy is essentially, I just got this from outside. And as you can see, you know, there's always like a bunch of pine needles, pine cones, sticks, and loads and loads of aggregates. And as you can see, it's super dusty and there's really like not a whole lot going on here. And the number one thing that we have to remember in the soils that are around our house is chances are like it's been manipulated in some way because our houses got built there. So when our houses were built, you know, they just kind of moved the soil around that was there and a bunch of machinery probably went on top of it and it kind of destroyed what was there. So essentially like this is what we find kind of around our houses where there's just like nothing going on. And I hate walking across this stuff in my flip-flops because my feet always get really dusty. And the thing that we have to remember about these soils is because they're so dry, they tend to be hydrophobic. Like when we put water on here, it just runs off and it creates mud. And like, it doesn't, it has such little amount of organic matter that it, it's really hard to grow stuff in here. There's hardly any nutritional content in this soil. And that brings me to the second type of soil that we find. And essentially I call this one Tahoe landscape soil here. I can kind of get a little bit closer. Tahoe landscape soil is essentially this soil here that's been amended with some compost, organic matter. Somebody kind of put something, some effort in here at some point to kind of start try and make it a little bit more viable for something to grow. So you can see the difference here between these two, right? You can see how like this one is so dry, it's like lighter in color. This one actually has some moisture retention in it. It's got a much darker color and it's, you know, plants, some, some plants can be really happy in here. This is like where we plant our bushes perennials, herbs, trees, wildflowers do pretty well in this stuff. This is like essentially what I would say 90% of us have um, kind of growing kind of around our houses that we've tried to do something with. And, you know, so the, when you have this, <laughs> you're trying to get to this <laughs> because this you can grow stuff in. This is really, really hard. <laughs> so how do you get from here to here, you add, my friend, compost. So compost, the, you know, this is just a bag of compost that I bought from the land, from you know the landscape place, and compost is just straight up organic matter, 
and it's usually got all kinds of good stuff in it, like kelp and, you know, composted chicken manure, bat guano, whatever. This is what I use to mulch pretty much every spring, every fall, every, I throw it in the bottom of every hole that I plant something new in. This is where all the nutrients live. This is how you get from this to this is this. <laughs> And it takes a long time. The other kind of soil that I see, and my friend Gareth, who may or may not be here, she I got this from her. She's been growing stuff in Tahoe for decades. And this is her mature garden bed soil. So this is what I would grow veggies, flowers, crops in. And this is from a raised bed. She's been amending it with her own compost for decades. And it's filled with all kinds of stuff. As you can kind of see, it's a little bit finer. You don't have as many per, um, rocks and stuff in it. There's actually, there's a worm in here somewhere. <laughs> um, there he is. And there's actually all kinds of like nematodes and other like little bugs and stuff in here as well. And so this is like a thriving little mini ecosystem. It's got like little funguses in here, mycorrhizae, all kinds of good stuff. Um, I did extensive soil testing on this and it's really viable. She's got lots of available nutrients and she just has bumper crops all the time. And this is kind of what we're going for if we're trying to grow stuff here in Tahoe is this mature garden bed soil. So how do we get here? <laughs> Our friend compost. And you can get there from this as well. This here is our friend potting soil. And I do, the majority of what I do, because I live in a small apartment, is container gardening. So I don't have the freedom to be able to have like these huge, big raised beds. I, I get that on it, the demonstration or the food bank garden in Truckee. Um, but, you know, this is really, the, I get organic potting soil and you, there's always like some sort of like perlite and stuff. This helps increase um, the aerability and kind of, um, you know, kind of gives some, gives, sorry, excuse me, gives some uh, arability to the soil. There's always some organic matter in here. There's a little bit of grit, like sand in here um, to kind of give it a little bit of mineral aspect to help with drainage. Um, you know, this, this stuff is good too. And I pretty much, oh, even to this, like today I prepped some new um, little raised bed things that I bought for my, for my deck. And I mixed this and this, and I'm just going to keep coming back to this and saying this over and over again, because this right here, your compost, this is your best friend. And if you can make it yourself, you're stoked. You're not spending money on it, but this is what you need to add to your soil all the time. This is where the nutrients come from. So the last bit thing that I have here, and it's just like an example of mulch is, um, I have some orchid bark here. So I use this um, in, I use this in my pots around my house. I'll use it in my outdoor pots if I feel like they need a little extra kind of protection. Um, you know, really anything that you kind of just cover the surface of the soil with is mulch. You know, this can be mulch and I do use compost as mulch all the time. Orchid bark, decomposed granite, sand. Um, you know, there's so many different kinds of mulches, and it really just depends on your aesthetic, what you're looking for, and um, things like that is really what is going to dictate what kind of mulch you want. And I can do a whole class on mulch because it's pretty complicated. All right, Anne, can I go back to my slides? Of course, I'm going to remove the spotlight, but you'll need to start screen sharing again. Oop. Well, we talked about all the different ones there. <laughs> so what do we need? What do plants really need nutrient wise? They need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, they need potassium, they need micronutrients. Um, nitrogen is the most important kind of thing. Um, it's the thing that we're kind of always losing. Nitrogen is the most soluble of all of the nutrients. So once you add it, like it, the plants just kind of use it, what's there. 
and then it goes away. So um, you really, you know, need to you add it continuously. Um, it slowly releases via organic matter, um, via your compost throughout the growing season. There are some slow release fertilizers out there. Um, but during the growing season, especially early in the growing season, like right now as your stuff is just starting to emerge, nitrogen is really what propels upward growth in your plants. So once a week is really a good amount to amend with some liquid fertilizer early in the season. And, you know, I use, I, I kind of use the rule fertilizer Friday because it reminds me it's time to fertilize because otherwise I'm like, when did I do it last? So if you could just it's just like a little acronym to kind of help you remember like, oh, I'll fertilize on Friday. That's what day I'm doing it. And the number one thing to remember when you're adding a soil amendment, especially a liquid fertilizer, is you're not using it as watering. Like you always need to fertilize in addition to your watering regime, because essentially you want your plants to be able to absorb as much of that nitrogen as possible. If they're thinking they're getting water instead of nitrogen, like they're going to like forget to even soak up the nitrogen and they're just gonna, it's just gonna leak out. So you always wanna, when you fertilize, you wanna use it in addition to your watering, not as a substitute. So keep that in mind, even with your houseplants. Um, that's something I, it, I didn't know for a while. So it's a little tidbit. Um, what makes nitrogen so appointment, uh, important is they are what create amino acids. Amino acids what create protein. Proteins what create carbohydrates and creates the food for the plants. So there are the major component in chlorophyll. Um, and that's, that's what makes our plants green, nitrogen. So when nitrogen deficiency happens, it includes yellowing, dropping of leaves, flowering, fruit protection delayed, weak looking plants. So as you can kind of see this guy down here, it's kind of an example of low nitrogen. So is this guy kind of burning? This guy, this is actually kind of more of a, maybe it's too much nitrogen. If you kind of get these chemical-based you know, fertilizers with really high nitrogen content, you can actually burn your plants. If you add um, animal waste, like straight up horse manure or chicken manure without composting it first, there's so much available nitrogen that it can burn your plants. So always use composted chicken manure or cow manure or horse manure or whatever. And and it's going to talk about this a little bit more extensively, but this can also happen if you're kind of using too much nitrogen on your plants, this algae can kind of build up in the lake and it's what runs off and kind of like screws up some of our water. So you want to be careful. So I, I kind of prescribe to like use a little bit often because you want to make it available to your plants, but you don't want to overdo it. So some ways to increase nitrogen is my favorite is legumes. So legumes are peas, beans, lupins, clover. Um, it's essentially, it's such a cool thing that happens. The nitrogen from the air is fixated to the plants via a symbiotic microbial um, relationship. So there's these they essentially kind of have these little nodules on the roots that create this perfect little environment for these bacteria to live in the roots. And that bacteria helps convert that atmospheric nitrogen into a soluble form of nitrogen that the plants can use. It's so cool. So when you plant peas and beans and stuff like that in your garden, they actually leave a fair amount of nitrogen back in the soil. And so that's why crop rotation and paying attention to what you plant where is super important um, because, you know, I you want to rotate where you planted peas last year with something that uses a lot of nitrogen, like tomatoes or something the next year. So if you're constantly rotating these nitrogen rich plants in, pl in plants that kind of deplete it, then you can kind of really increase the available nitrogen in your soil. So the other way, of course, broken record, building organic matter, composted manure, compost, <laughs> um, organic fertilizer, kelp, seaweed is another one, bone meal, um, manure tea. Um, so these have kind of become a lot more popular. It's something I did. Um, I grew up on a farm and this is something we always did when the plants need a little something extra is you take a shovel full of compost and you put it in a five gallon bucket and then you fill it with the hose and you let it sit in the sun for a couple of days. And then essentially you have this super soluble form of like ready to go organic fertilizer. 
And um, and then we you just take that water, put it in the watering bucket and water the plants with it. I usually dilute it a little bit because it's pretty um, thick. And now when you go to some of these landscaping places, you can actually buy compost tea kind of concoctions and then there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. So depending on what your plants need and what's being depleted in your garden. Fish emulsion, I've used a fair amount of fish emulsion. The biggest problem with fish emulsion is it smells like fish. <laughs> so your plants are happy, but I usually like water and then walk away. It's not something I wanna put on my garden if I'm gonna be like hanging out there because I can't stand the way it smells. Um, oops, moved the wrong way, here we go. Phosphorus is the next one. So phosphorus helps plants convert other nutrients into the usable building blocks. Um, phosphorus is what creates fruit, fruit phosphorus, fruit phosphorus. So like you can, if you're having trouble and you're just like getting a lot of greenery, like maybe you don't have enough phosphorus and it really helps with flowers and developing strong roots. Um, and if your plants just seem like really weak and kind of unhappy, like maybe there's a phosphorus deficiency. Some things that will really help is bone meal, rock phosphate, and compost. <laughs> um, potassium. Um, so potassium in its molecular form is K plus one. So essentially what potassium does is in the stomata, which is essentially these like little air holes in the underside of the leaves, um, or on the top of the leaves, sorry. <laughs> um, they open and close by passing potassium back and forth, which creates, like it literally is the lungs of the plants. It's where it collects the CO2 so it can do photosynthesis. So if it doesn't have enough potassium, it's not exchanging that molecule back and forth to open and close the stomata. So it's when there's scorching or leaf curling, um, it really inhibits root development and it makes, it makes the plants like really sad. So potassium is super important, but the good news is, is it tends to stick around. So if, you know, it's not quite as soluble as nitrogen. So it, once you have potassium, you know, you, it's good. Um, compost, um, composted banana peels. So uh, what I do, I do this a couple of times over the summer. Um, I eat a bunch of bananas, <laughs> I cut them up and then I pour hot water over them in a jar. And then, you know, but careful, it's not too hot because you don't want to burn yourself. Shake it up and leave it on the counter for like a week or two. And it'll just turn into like this wicked banana solution. And then I um, strain out the peels and I use that water to like water all the plants. And that, that's enough potassium. And as soon as I do that, everybody's like, yay, thank you. <laughs> I always notice such a huge difference in my plants after I give them amendments. Um, you know, if there's, if everybody seems a little sad and weak, it's like, oh, maybe it's time for an amendment. And so sometimes I'll kind of, you know, give it a little extra fertilizer or one of my special concoctions. Here's a list of some of the important micronutrients, chlorine, boron, zinc, copper, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. Um, these are, you know, I have like one little thing of like, it's like a plant vitamin and I put it a cap full of it in with my fertilizer and it has all these micronutrients in it. And I give that to my plants every time I give them a little fertilizer. So that those help. Um, the, the thing I, I find so interesting about chlorine is if I'm sure you've all been by the sea and everyone's gardens by the sea always look so lush and vibrant because there's chlorine in the air and those plants get way more chlorine than the rest of us, than the rest of us get in our gardens. So um, that's one of the reasons that the garden seaside looks so bright and brilliant. It's because of the chlorine. So let's talk a little bit about organic labeling because I feel like this is really confusing to a lot of people. This is a fertilizer that I have. Um, and I just love the label because I think it's hilarious. Kelp me, kelp you. So this is a liquid kelp fertilizer. Um, and as you can see down here, hopefully, um, these numbers right here, Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. I didn't realize that these words would be here, so I'm sorry. It's kind of um, can't quite see it. But in any fertilizer, here I have another fertilizer right here. Here's the Agro Thrive. Thrive. I know it's backwards, but there's always three numbers. Like this one's three, three, two, and those are always N P. Okay, so it's how much nitrogen is in there, how much phosphorus, how much potassium. And if 
if those numbers are massive, if they're like 30, 30, 30, or 20, 20, 20, um, chances are that's not an organic fertilizer. What, the thing that makes it an organic fertilizer is this label right here, this OMRI label. If, that, if it has that, then you know you're getting a good organic product that's been certified and it's not gonna have a bunch of weird um, chemicals in it. The thing that's scary about a lot of those industrial fer fertilizers is they're mostly petroleum based. So they use the petroleum process in order to create that fertilizer. I don't know, I don't want that on my food. Um, I don't really know who does, <laughs> but this ensures that you don't have that. So look for this. If you're unsure, uh, if you're at the store and you're not sure, look for this OMRI label. And remember that the, the numbers are nitrogen, potassium, and or nitrogen, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the three numbers, and that's their correspondence. Um, troubleshooting. So this is probably one of the hardest things about organic gardening is figuring out natural methods to manage problems that arise in the garden. And there's always problems in the garden. There's always pests of like different sizes. There's molds. There's all kinds of weird things like plants die unexpectedly and you're trying to figure out why. So how, how do we manage these in an organic way? I have to say that I use Google Google a lot, you know, I mean, if I can't draw on my own knowledge, I'll definitely spend a lot of time on Google and YouTube, just looking it up, seeing what other people have used to solve the problem. I also talk a lot, you know, I'm super knowledgeable, but stuff is always kind of baffling me. Um, you know, I, I go to the nursery, like usually the once or twice a week. So I, I talk to the girls in the, in the men there, um, about some of the problems that they have and how they go about fixing them. So don't be afraid to just talk to your fellow gardeners. There's all sorts of cool um, Facebook groups now. You know, I'm, I'm a part of many Facebook groups where, I mean, I can, I'll dispense advice when I have time, but you can kind of put your question and your picture out there and see what other people have done. We have this amazing technology now to utilize. We're not like stuck trying to look it up in an encyclopedia or something. These are probably the two biggest pests that I fight in that most Tahoe gardeners fight. Aphids. I have never not had aphids in my garden. Um, they always come. They usually come after I'm gone for a few days. I like go backpacking or something and I come back and they've completely gone nuts somewhere in my garden. Um, the prevention is the best medicine. I have used a million different um, methods using soap and garlic, spicy pepper, different um, essential oils. I think the thing that works best is just take that plant, try and try and get it away from your other plants and spray them down with a hose, kill them when you see them and just kind of keep, once you blast them off, they, they really have a hard time recovering. So if you can really blast them off and get them off a couple of times, like repeatedly over a couple of days, you can, you can really kind of cut down on the population. The other thing that I've had medium success with is ladybugs. And you can usually buy a bit bag of ladybugs at the nursery for like 10 bucks. And the trick that I found out about ladybugs is if you put them in the refrigerator and they get really slow. And then if you release them after sundown at night, then they stay lethargic and they'll wake up in the morning on the plant because they'll stay where they they are and they'll find the lady they'll find the aphids and they'll go to town. If you release them in the middle of the day, they're like wide awake and they'll just fly away. <laughs> so um, I putting them in the fridge. I, I always like have a couple glasses of wine and like have a big celebration. It's fun to release them. Um, I always enjoy it. <laughs> uh, critters is probably what I get asked about the most. Um, they like the same food that we, we've eaten. We like to eat. I can't tell you how many times I've said, I'm going to harvest that lettuce when I get home. And the squirrels go ahead and do it for me before I get home. Um, so some of the things that kind of help keep critters away is 
um, use hardware cloth. Um, if you have raised beds, use hardware cloth on the bottom because that'll keep them from coming up from the bottom. And you want to use cage lids on the top, also with the hardware cloth. Chicken wire doesn't really work because they can get through it. So you really want to use the hardware cloth. Hardware cloth is essentially a really stiff looking screen and your pollinators can get in, but the squirrels and the birds and stuff can't. Um, there's also these like little sound spike things that um, they are activated by um, movement in the garden. You can, and they kind of put out this annoying noise. It's kind of sounds just like clicking to us, but I think it's like a high pitched noise that they can kind of hear like a dog whistle kind of. And, um, and they usually have like a little solar panel or something on them. And you put those throughout the garden. I find that my dog, you know, I always garden with my dog, cats, those kind of things. Like my dog is awesome at keeping squirrels and blue jays out of my garden. Blue jays have really wreaked havoc on my garden before too. One of the things that I found that kind of keeps um, the birds away is I use pinwheels. Uh, you know, you buy them for a dollar at the grocery store at the 4th of July. You can stick them in right next to your plant and they go um, and it, the birds hate them. Um, you know, I also put out sometimes those big fake owls. I've also seen the birds land on my big fake owl. So um, I think that kind of a multi-prong approach to managing these pests and these critters is really the best way to do it. Okay. Um, weeds is the bane of every gardener. The best thing to do is pull them up by the roots by hand. Uh, they steal valuable resources from your crops and prevent growth. So you wanna get rid of them as soon as you see them. Uh, you can use a concentrated white, winter, white wine vinegar solution, such as acetic acid, to kind of use some bigger small um, of areas that you're trying to get rid of, like pathways or stuff like that. Uh, but you want to be careful because they kill everything. So if you're trying to grow something and you spray some acetic acid on it, it's going to kill whatever's there. And it kind of takes a while for it to leach through. Um, and it's food safe. Um, so just be careful where you use it. Um, trial and error. What grows well in your garden is often learned through trial and error. Um, it differs from year to year. Sometimes I have stuff that does awesome, and then the next year it does terrible because you know our seasons are so different from year to year. So I just really try and go with the, my successes and keep building on my successes. And I really try hard not to get down on myself if I kill plants. Don't get down on yourself if you kill plants. I kill plants all the time. It's fine. <laughs> That's what's great. Like you can replace them. You can start over. It's not the end of the world. You can still um, grow your plants. Um, the strength of starters, nutrient availability. There's so many different factors that go into your gardening success. The important thing is to have fun. Um, so if you have any questions for me that I don't answer here at our little Q&A at the end, feel free to send any questions via email to either guys so home at gmail.com or um, you can send it to my business email, which is Tahoe integrated landscaping at gmail.com. Um, you can also go visit my website, which is Tahoe integrated landscaping um, dot com. And I'm going to turn it over to Anne, who's going to talk about lake friendly gardening and kind of integrate some of the stuff that I talked about to make sure that we keep our watersheds um, nice and healthy. Thanks so much, Heather. I'm going to stop sharing Heather's screen, but I'll put back up those emails at the end so that if you all have any questions, we can absolutely have, uh, if we don't get to them during the question and answer period, make sure that we will get those answered later on. But as Heather mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, watershed friendly gardening just very quickly because Heather's gone through in depth um, what we're gonna be putting in our gardens and what is a healthy usage of fertilizer and things in our garden. However, we also wanna understand the why of why we're being conscientious of what we're putting on our plants and the practices that we're using in each of our gardens. So I'm gonna talk briefly about why watershed health is important, how watershed health can be impacted and what our gardening practices can be to best minimize the impact on our watershed because we live in a really unique and beautiful area. 
just to make sure we're all on the same page before I go any further talking about watershed health, I want us to all know what a watershed is. Um, we live in a very unique watershed. The Lake Tahoe Basin um, is basically a watershed. Any precipitation, rain, snow that falls in one specific area will drain to a single point. And here in the Lake Tahoe Basin, we have 63 streams that flow into the lake. And then we have one outflow point uh, which is the lower Truckee River that flows through Truckee and on to Reno and ultimately ends up in Pyramid Lake. But this is our regional watershed that a lot of us participating today are living in. Some of us might be coming from Carson City area as well, but watersheds exist everywhere. So this is not specific just to Lake Tahoe. And we want to be conscious of um, what we're doing no matter where we're gardening. And I know personally, I don't have a yard where I live. I do all container gardening. And just because I container garden doesn't mean that I'm exempt from this in any way because anything I put in those containers can also end up in our watershed. Watershed health matters for a number of different reasons and we could talk about that all day long, but the Lake Tahoe and Truckee River supply a lot of water to residents in the area. And so maintaining our watershed health is important for that reason, for our municipal water supply. Anything that's harmful can end up in the water that we recreate in and drink from. And this is not just our surface water. Anything that goes into our environment can ultimately seep down and end up in our groundwater supply as well. So any groundwater that is being pulled up and used can also have those harmful particles in them. And of course, we love to have clean, clear, beautiful and algae free waters that are enjoyable to look at. And we wanna be able to look at these two views on the right here instead of views like this. At the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center, we're doing a lot of research on changing algae populations within Lake Tahoe, um, as well as understanding how and preventing invasive species from getting in the lake. And so this is just a number of different photos that have come from either citizen science reports through our citizen science Tahoe app, or we have a couple photos of our research divers. And this photo on the bottom right here is actually uh, the Truckee River uh, along the 89 corridor between Tahoe City and Truckee just um, in mid-April. And you can see some algae growing there. Lake Tahoe is naturally what we call an oligotrophic lake. So the nutrient levels are pretty low in the lake naturally. And over time, our research team has been studying how uh, the lake environment has been changing. And we want to understand this changing lake environment because of two reasons. Our clarity is being impacted, which you can see here in this graph. Clarity of Lake Tahoe is one of the primary focuses of research at the Tahoe Environmental Research Center. And clarity can be affected by multiple things, including sediments as they erode, as well as growing algae populations. Algae can affect the blueness of the lake as well, but these things kind of all work hand in hand and are a really complicated uh, topic that we could give a whole presentation on. And if you're interested in learning more, I'd be happy to share any resources with you. But for our gardening purposes today, we wanna focus on algae growth and preventing erosion in our gardens because those fine sediments that Heather was showing us in her soil demonstration when they end up in the lake can actually impact our lake health and our river health. So anything that gets added to the water can ultimately change our watershed and the waters that we live and rely on. But like I was saying, things like land disturbance, whether it be human development or whether it be us gardening and a rainstorm comes through and takes a layer of topsoil off and puts those sediments in the lake can impact the lake or the river itself. And Heather talked extensively about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but it's those nutrients that help our plants in our gardens that can also impact plants or animals and organisms like algae to grow in our lake. So if we add additional nutrients that don't get taken up by our plants in our gardens, they can wash off or run off rather and actually impact um, the health of the greater ecosystem. At the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center, our scientists have been studying something called primary productivity since the 1960s. And all that really means is the rate at which algae and phytoplankton grow within the lake. And as you can see from this graph here on the right from our annual state of the lake report, 
primary productivity has been increasing since it's been started being studied in the 1960s. There's been multiple steps to prevent uh, this primary productivity from increasing, but as we've had more human development in the basin and in the Truckee area, we can see that the primary productivity and that algae growth rate has continued to increase. And though it correlates with human development, like I said, there has been many steps taken to minimize the amount of nutrients going into the lake. Dr. Charles Goldman did a number of bioassays on Lake Tahoe's water to understand how nutrients could ultimately impact the Lake Tahoe ecosystem. A bioassay is basically just a test of the concentration of a substance on living tissues or cells. And so in this case, he used concentrated nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus and algae cells called chlorella, a type of algae that is frequently used in scientific experiments. Ultimately, with those bioassays, Dr. Goldman's outcome showed that more nutrients lead to more algal growth. And this conclusion led to all tertiary treated sewage water, or sort of like treated wastewater, being pumped out of the Lake Tahoe Basin instead of being pumped into the lake after being treated. This removed a significant number of nutrients because even once that water is treated, those nutrients don't get removed. Even though Dr. Goldman's experiment showed that this could potentially impact the Lake Tahoe health um, and algae growth rates. Even having all of that tertiary treated sewage water pumped out of the basin, you can still see that we had this increase in uh, primary productivity over time. I wanted to do a test of this myself to help myself understand how my gardening practices might be impacting the, my local watershed's health. So I obtained from my office four Erlenmeyer flasks and created four different conditions to test how chlorella, the algae that I mentioned, is impacted by different nutrient concentrations. On the left here, I used high nutrient water um, and mixed it with the chlorella. I, we at our Tahoe Science Center have a couple fish aquariums and I actually just took some fish water from the tanks since they like to poop a lot in the water. I definitely know there's a lot of nutrients in there from cleaning the tanks at work. And in our second system here, I added uh, that nutrient dense water from the fish tanks with some Lake Tahoe water. In the third system, I had just Lake Tahoe water and the chlorella. And then in the fourth system as a control, I used deionized, just basically super pure water from our laboratory to mix with the chlorella. I started this on March 22nd. And over the last 43 days, you can see here on the right how that algal growth has changed based on the concentration of each of those in the water. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen there for a second so I can actually show you all up close using my cutting board as a background. Our deionized water here had pretty minimal growth. I had a pretty high uh, starting level of algae. And so it's mostly just algae that settled. This is the algae with Lake Tahoe water alone. And after those 43 days, it pretty much looks like my control. So the Lake Tahoe water alone, without nutrients being added, has pretty minimal algal growth. Like I said, Lake Tahoe is a naturally low nutrient lake. But if we have that same Lake Tahoe water with some added nutrients, we saw a significant increase in growth here, just in this case. And our last scenario, just using the high nutrient water to make sure that adding nutrients would increase the algal growth you can see here are pretty kind of gross looking algal growth. And being able to do this experiment at home just showed me how adding anything to the water, even a small amount can ultimately change the growth rate of really any organism that relies on those nutrients in the watershed, whether it be something in my garden, whether it be something between me and the body of water that it might end up in. For me, I live in Kings Beach, so that's directly to the lake. But if those end up in the lake, they can also promote the growth of algae or other plants that live in the lake. So without going into too much depth on the science of it, I just wanna tie this back to gardening and have us be conscientious that our actions affect our watershed. Any nutrients or chemicals, if you're not sticking to a totally organic gardening regime 
added to your garden can impact creeks, streams, rivers, lakes, and groundwater. And any fertilizers that you put on your plants and what those fertilizers do for your plants and those necessary nutrients that they need can also do for any organisms like algae that live in the watershed. So with that in mind, as Heather's gone through and talked about what those different fertilizers and what those different nutrients do for our plants, we wanna be conscientious of when and how we're fertilizing or amending our plants and our soils. We wanna be mindful of the concentration and the amount of the fertilizer that we use because even using a low ratio fertilizer, if we use a lot of it, it's still a very high concentration of nutrients to be adding to our plants. If there's any precipitation in the forecast, like Heather was showing us with those native Tahoe soils being hydrophobic, if there's precipitation coming and you're planting in those hydrophobic soils, and this kind of ties into my last point as well, that moist soils are best at facilitating the uptake of those nutrients. If there's a chance for precipitation and a cause for runoff, you better hold off on applying fertilizer that could run off and impact the watershed because it's more likely to run off than to actually be used by your plants. If you have container plants like I do that are in a covered area, that might not be as much of a concern, but everyone's garden is different. And the last point, like I was just saying, moist soils are really best at uptaking any of those nutrients. And Heather spoke about this a little bit and Heather is far more knowledgeable about gardening and fertilizer concentrations and applications. So I'm definitely gonna defer to her on that. But it's important for me in my gardening to make sure that I'm making sure my soils and my plants are well watered before I have those fertilizer Friday parties and um, ensure as well that I'm mulching over my plants to reduce any sort of potential for erosion and evaporation. That'll keep my plants happier and help them growing big and strong. So we briefly just wanted to go through and talk about how our gardening practices can ultimately impact our watershed. And I know a lot of dialogue nowadays is definitely speaking about how everything we do can be bad for the environment. But if we're well educated about it and take the time to think through what our actions are and what we're doing, we can minimize our impact as much as possible. And that's what we really wanna do here. We have a beautiful, beautiful ecosystem that we get to share and live in together. And if we can connect to nature through our gardening as well as protect our environment in the same time, why not? But that's all from me on watershed friendly gardening. There's been a lot of really great questions coming in throughout Heather's presentation. I've started to compile in a document that I will screen share, um, but the first question that you can start thinking about Heather is when considering south versus north facing, if you're going to use raised beds or a mini greenhouse, can they be placed on decks? Um. Well, um, absolutely. Um, you know, I do the majority of my gardening on my deck and I have a self-facing deck. Um, and, you know, the number one thing you would need to kind of, that I'm always kind of paying attention to is how much kind of runoff is happening on my deck because I don't want to adversely affect the, um, the structure of my deck. You know, if you're kind of constantly dripping irrigation or something, you know, you can kind of experience some rot. Um, so with my self-facing deck, um, you know, I am just super conscious of that, that when it's really hot in the summer that I'm keeping up on my watering to kind of prevent that scorching. I'm also, you know, and it depends on the season too, you know, so like right now, um, even though there's still some potential for frost, I'm kind of planting, I've, I've already de-seeded some um, cold weather crops. Like I love planting radishes in the spring, like radishes are one of my favorite vegetables and they, and they have one of the shortest gestation periods. So like you plant a seed and you can have a radish in 40 days um, for many varieties. So I like to plant those early in the spring. You can also plant peas really early in the spring. They don't mind it cold. Parsley really likes it cold, collard greens, stuff like that. So I do like literally a rotation of kind of those colder crops, like super early, even on my south facing deck. But then come July, I can't grow radishes anymore. They just bolt. So that's, so essentially I kind of have like some squashes 
and um, you know, kind of like some like little mini pumpkins. I kind of try and do a lot of stuff that's smaller um, because you know, with the bigger vegetables, they need a longer gestation rate. So like I have a lot of success with smaller vegetables out on my deck. And um, I think it's great, you know, I mean, I'm able to hook up my irrigation via hose. Um, you know, my deck is a little Eden in the summer. <laughs> I don't know how else you would do it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Where can we find the wax tinge for cold frames? Um, you know, when I wrote the grant that we got the cold frames from, I was able to get them at Costco, but I don't, I know that last year when I looked for them for a client of mine, you know, they were sold out everywhere because everyone went gardening crazy last year. And I know it slowed down a little bit, but um, you can order that online and um, you can actually buy just the hinge online on a couple of different websites. I don't, I can't remember any of them off the top of my head, but I've been able to kind of find them on a couple of websites. And especially if you know specifically what you're looking for, it's a little bit easier to kind of narrow it down and find the right ones. How can you compost up here considering the bears? I'm concerned about bears, coyotes, bobcats being attracted to compost in gardens. Any suggestions for keeping them out? Um, absolutely. Um, so there it's composting up here is complicated for sure, you know, because of the problems associated um, with the food and the animals. Having it in a protected area, you know, that they can't and get into, you know, the, the, the compost bins in the garden in Turkey is within a big fenced in area. Um, so that kind of helps keep out the big animals. Um, it still doesn't do a very good job of keeping out the small animals. Um, one of the things that's really going to help your composting up here and something I always suggest to people is if you puree your compost. So before it gets super gross, throw it in the, throw it in the blender because essentially this is gonna speed up your compost process and it's gonna, and then when you go to put it in your compost, dig a little hole, pour the puree in there, cover it up. Composting is a whole nother class unto itself, you know, cause essentially if you were composting your, your veggies, you know, you, you want like a 30 to one ratio of like browns to greens and your veggies are your greens. So you shouldn't be putting piles and piles of food in your compost anyway. There needs to be a fair amount of like straw or, you know, some sort of like brown. Um, you know, there's, like I said, compost is a whole nother thing, but you also want to avoid meat, eggshells, stuff that's like really stinky and stuff like that. If you're kind of sticking to just pure vegetables um, and you puree them, you know, you really I, you, it can really cut down on the the bears, coyotes, bobcats, and kind of thing being in there. Awesome. <laughs> um, I will say also regarding compost. Last season we had a lot of requests for composting class. There is a great amount of interest in the area. Unfortunately, we didn't have the capacity to do a compost specific class this season. So if you just ask each of the different presenters kind of their tactics. Um, there's a wide variety of presenters that we have this season who will be able to share some tidbits of their perspective and what's worked for them. Is amendment essentially the same thing as compost material? When is the best time to add compost? Um, an amendment is anything you add to your soil. So, you know, so compost is definitely an amendment. And the best time I do compost in the spring and in the fall hands down. So like I caretake a bunch of gardens and tomorrow morning I'm going over for the first time to go work on a garden that I've worked in and for a couple of years and I'm going over there with a big bag of compost. And the first thing I'm going to do is, is mulch um, all of those little babies coming up with a bunch of compost. And when you mulch with compost or really any kind of mulch, um, I meant to mention this in the presentation, is you don't want to go up like straight up and like around the stem of the plant. You want to kind of compost around it. You want to give, you don't want to suffocate the plant with whatever it is that you're mulching. You want to give it a little bit of room. And essentially you're just trying to enrich the soil around the plant that's available for the roots. And if you look at a plant, like 
there's just as much plant underground as there is above ground. So like you're not, the root isn't just like right below the stem there. It's, it extends and it's all the way around. So, you know, you don't just necessarily need to have it like right there at the bottom of the stem of the plant, like around the plant is good. And it works great as a mulch too. What is the correct soil balance for NPK when prepping beds? Um, so this varies pretty much like across the board, right? Um, and what the balance is, is and what the numbers are not like necessarily specific to whatever it is that you're planting. You just want to have them available. So essentially, I have a couple of different meters that allow me to test available nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And so like, you just want to make sure that you have some available for your plants and you'll be able to ensure that you have them available for your plants by adding compost. These two were pretty similar, so I tried to combine them. Do you recommend slow release fertilizer for vegetables? Is it better for runoff prevention and compost versus fertilizer? Does compost pose the same runoff risk? So I don't use slow, re slow release fertilizer in any of my, um, in any of my gardening, like uh, like Osmocote and stuff is really popular with like a lot of the landscape companies because it's not organic as far as I can tell. Um, I think that there's some debate about that, but um, and you don't really get to control when it's released. And I like to have a little bit more manipulation over when I'm adding stuff to plants. So um, I use a combination of compost. So I'm adding my organic matter and I'm making nutrients available to my plants in the spring and in the fall. And then I amend with liquid fertilizer throughout the growing season. So um, that allows there to be nitrogen available because um, essentially your plants kind of need more nitrogen in the early part of the season. And they kind of need more like phosphorus and potassium like later on in the season. So you can use kind of both of those. Um, it, you know, and you kind of can back off on the fertilizer like later on in the season, like they really need it when they're growing and they're growing strong and they're creating all those leaves. And compost, I would say, you know, there is some risk of runoff if you are, you know, adding a ridiculous amount of it and it's like super saturated and it kind of goes off. But in general, compost is also organic matter, which is going to help with retention. And kind of um, kind of release those um, nutrients more slowly through into your soil and kind of create a more balanced um, e ecosystem within your soil. Like I said, we're trying to create a, like a soil ecosystem. You want it to have worms, bugs, microbes, all that stuff kind of going on. And the addition of compost is really going to help attract all those things and create that biodiversity that we're trying so hard to build in our soils. Uh, next question, would you add fertilizer to plant starts also and watering on top of fertilizer? I'm growing starts from seeds and I'm afraid that would be too much liquid and cause damping off. You definitely don't want to add fertilizer to plants uh, starts. Um, I actually have some kind of cool stuff that I could show you. I don't know if we have um, the ability to kind of show this camera off again, Anne. I can stop sharing and I'll make, if you want the small camera. Yeah. Spotlighted. So these are from, as you can kind of see behind me, I have an indoor hydroponic gardening system where I grow all of my own herbs and lettuces and stuff year round. So these are some starts that I started, gosh, these are probably about maybe a month old, maybe less than that, maybe three weeks old. So when they're little like this, the seed has everything it needs to start the plant. So as you can kind of see, these leaves right here, these little ones, they look different than the main seeds. This is a cuca melon. I'm really excited for these. They're, they're a mixture between a cucumber and a melon. It's like a cool veggie fruit. So I'm really excited. Um, these are called the seed leaves. These are called the true leaves. And you can see it here on these cherry tomatoes. Um, 
sorry, I'm starting cherry tomatoes from seeds. It's very ambitious. Um, again, these are the seed leaves. These are the true leaves. And essentially you want to have about three sets of true leaves established before you start fertilizing. Because then you kind of run into the risk of over of kind of overdoing it for them because they, they're not really needing those nutrients. They have everything that they need from packed into the seed until they get to that point. So you want to wait until the seedling is a lot more established, like this guy. This is a lemon cucumber that I started a little bit longer ago. So as you can see, here are, oops, maybe you can't. <laughs> he needs to go tire. He's big. <laughs> see, I'm a lot bigger. So as you can see, this guy, these are the seed leaves. And then this is like the first set of true leaves here. And then this is the second set of true leaves. And then the third ones are just starting to bud up right there. And so once you get those three sets in, that's when you kind of want to start your, your weekly fertilizer regime, as long as it's not raining. <laughs> All right. We do have some more questions. I want to be conscious of everyone's time um, since we are over our hour and 15 minutes. Um, I'm gonna share just a little bit of information regarding um, the rest of our workshop series. And then if Heather, you're willing to answer uh, some of the outstanding questions, we can make sure that we get all those addressed. But if anyone is waiting for that additional information, I wanna um, respect everyone's dinner time. Whoop, I shared the wrong PowerPoint. Give me one second. Like we were talking about earlier, we have uh, six more workshops in our series coming up and we will be talking next week about potatoes. Um, and then with and, Melissa. And we're still seeing my soil, so I think you gotta change your screen. Oh, okay, thank you. I am learning the spotlight <laughs> in Zoom. But are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So if you have any question, follow-up questions for Heather, um, and we'll get back to a few more questions in our question and answer period. But like she was saying earlier, um, you can reach out to her with any questions at GaiaSoulHome at gmail.com or Tahoe.IntegratedLandscaping at gmail.com. And if you have any questions for me regarding watershed health, or if you're interested in reading any of those scientific papers, um, you can ask me for any of that information at andgram at ucdavis.edu. Our remaining workshops in our series this spring are potatoes next week, and then we'll be moving on to lettuce, kale, and chard beans and peas, strawberries, tomatoes, and herbs. And all of those workshops do have starter plants available with them for a $10 donation. You can register for any of those workshops on the slowfoodlaketahoe.org slash events website. They're managing all of the registration this year, whereas UC Davis Turk managed a lot of the registration last year. So be sure that if you are missing any emails or any correspondence that you check your junk or spam folder and mark them as a safe sender so that you can receive all communication regarding that. But we'll be back next week with Melissa uh, Guthrie, our potato expert talking about potatoes. Um, and if you have any of those questions, like we said, you can reach out to Heather Adams with any questions as you go through your gardening season this year. But if anyone needs to hop off, by all means, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure to kick off our second annual virtual workshop series. But we're going to keep answering these remaining questions. If anyone has time to stick around, um, there were just a few more. Um, would not enough phosphorus cause beets to be super small in the ground? I mean, potentially it's really hard to say, you know, it, I, I kind of get this kind of questions like this and at, without seeing it or kind of being able to test what's in the soil or what's available, you know, it's super hard to say, yes, that's absolutely it. Um, it's definitely a possibility, but um, usually it's with most things gardening, it's a little bit of like a troubleshooting kind of thing and you have to 
kind of figure out, um, you know, through a process of elimination, you know, and run some tests in order to figure out exactly what it is. I know that me, I've grown beets a couple of times and I've had all my beets up here turn out small. We just have a really short growing season. Um, and I think that they require kind of a little bit more humidity, a little bit more heat than uh, we have available, but I've always just kind of been, tried to be happy with my small amount of beets that I get, you know, mine are usually like really kind of pretty tiny. So <laughs> don't, don't feel bad. Even experts can't get big beets up here. I mean, maybe if you're like, maybe with a cold frame, you'd have more luck, you know? <laughs> uh, where can you buy the Harbor cloth to put in the bottom of bed? Um, it's hardware cloth, uh, not harbor cloth. I'm sorry if that didn't come out right, but um, at the hardware store. And it usually comes in a roll um, and you need a pair of wire cutters and a glove and a good pair of gloves so you don't scratch, um, scratch yourself too hard. It is a very unruly material to use, but it pre prevents a lot of heartache down the line with a little bit of hard work using it. Um, also like an electric, um, kind of like an industrial size staple gun, um, works really well with trying to like, um, use it. Like if you're kind of trying to put it directly into wood, if you're using it, um, on the bottom of something and you're trying to put it like in soil, uh, there's these things called earth staples, which are essentially kind of like these long, um, kind of squared looking things that kind of look like giant staples that are like really long. And those can kind of help bring it down. But like, I highly recommend that if you're gonna use hardware cloth on a raised bed, you put it all along the bottom and the sides. Because if there's any little spot that a critter can get through, he will, and he'll steal all your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a planting calendar for the Truckee Tahoe area example? Oh. We shift a little bit. <laughs> Plant greens and radishes in April, potatoes in May, et cetera. Um, no, and the major reason because for this is that our planting schedule is not the same from year to year. I would say that this year our um, our plants, you know, we're kind of able to start a little bit early because winter kind of faded out early. Um, but you know, technically it's still winter in Tahoe right now and you know i've definitely had snow on my deck in april may um and not be able to kind of go through that schedule that i would normally go so you really have the weather and what's happened in the winter is what dictates when you can plant things in tahoe and also you know really the only frost free month here is july you know, so like you kind of need a way to cover your plants and kind of protect them and kind of know and watch the weather very diligently to prevent um, any sort of damage from frost. And that's why the cold frames work really well. Also, I've had hailstorms really devastate my garden. I know I had a I had a hailstorm come in last year and completely destroy a handful of plants of mine that really just like broke my heart. So you know, I always have some old sheets ready to go to try and cover up some of my precious things, frost cloths, stuff like that. Um, and another thing that I use when I, especially if I'm growing tomatoes outside is um, I'll fill up like water jugs with hot water and kind of place those around my plants to kind of help keep them warm when it gets really cold. Um, I also have really big chunks of obsidian that I put around some of my more sensitive plants that are really big black rocks. And essentially they absorb the heat during the day, radiate it out towards night. They kind of help keep my plants warm. Um, and there's little tricks like that, that you can kind of use to help kind of regulate the temperatures and kind of be able to plant different stuff. I wish I had a thing that we could all kind of use, but that's it's not really how it works up here. <laughs> and a participant came in and commented that DIY uh, Home Center in South Lake Tahoe has some hardware cloth. So if you're in the South Lake area, um, that might be a good place to check out. Next question, could you put the veggie puree in a hole with rough compost as the brown? Um, so the brown wouldn't be something you could puree 
like the brown would be wood chips, straw, you know, it's, it's essentially brown material that's um, really high in lignin. Lignin is like what tree bark is made out of. It's like lignin is what's left over the, that you burn in the fireplace. Lignin is the, the brown of, of the plant. So um, you essentially need that brown lignin is your, is, is what is the ratio for the compost. So the veggie puree um, with rough compost in a hole, I don't know, I think that would be kind of rough. It's composting is, I, I have to go into way more detail about it to kind of get it to be something that it's, it's not an easy thing to do up here. <laughs> and, and it's a bit of a challenge. I would recommend if you're in the North Tahoe area to go to the Truckee um, Food Bank Garden and see what they have set up there. They are the most successful composters around. They do a lot of the composting for Truckee. And uh, that's definitely, you know, they have it down the best. And it's best to just kind of see it and ask the, ask the experts how they've managed to figure it out up here because it's more than I can kind of answer in this moment. When you start a garden bed with potting soil, do you do half and half with compost? Um, I don't read any, okay, sorry, my dog's kind of bugging me. Um, I would say I wouldn't go half and half. Um, I kind of do it, you know, I wish I had a perfect measurement, but I'm terrible at measuring things. You know, the pie, the pot, the waste beds that I started today, I would say that it was probably more like three quarters, one quarter, if I had to give a number. <laughs> what brand of organic fertilizer do you use besides compost? You know, I'm not specifically married to any brand. Uh, I would say the one that I'm most married to is the one that's on sale because <laughs> um, they tend to be really expensive. Um, you know, I, I've used the Agro Thrive. I've used, um, you know, Gardener and Bloom. I've used, um, those are probably my two biggest ones because those are the ones that are carried at my um, local uh, nursery in Truckee. Um, you know, I just kind of make sure that it's a multi-purpose fertilizer. Um, there's also the hydroponic store in Truckee, um, kind of out by the Pioneer Center. If you really want to nerd out on some organic fertilizers, that's the place to go. And I've gotten all kinds of really cool concoctions from that place. Um, it is a hydroponic store, so they tend to be a lot more expensive, but you can really get some really specific, really cool stuff from that place. Otherwise, I would say just a general organic fertilizer, make sure it has that OMR label. Great, we have three more questions and then we will let you enjoy the rest of your evening with Raven. Uh, <laughs> Heather mentioned fertilizer Fridays to use the approach of use a little bit often. Does this mean fertilize every week uh, or does that change dependent upon the season and the state of your plants? Um, I would say it's definitely a little bit of both. Um, early in the season, I definitely adhere pretty strictly, pretty strict to fertilizer Friday um, to kind of ensure that upward growth. And for me, I am so in tune with my plants. I can kind of tell, but just by, you know, and I, I look at all my plants every day. If I can tell if they're struggling, then, you know, I'll maybe give them a little something extra. Like, I definitely gave my plants like post hailstorm as everybody was just kind of blown to pieces. I gave them a little bit of extra fertilizer um, so they could kind of help them them recover. Um, the thing is, is if you kind of keep up on it and your plants have all the available nutrients that they need, you're not gonna have the, the problem with pests. Um, they're, they're gonna be strong. You're not gonna get the big aphid infestations. You're not gonna have the problems with white mold because um, your plants will have the nutrients available to them to fight that off. Um, and I would say, you know, I kind of back off a little bit in the fall, and especially as kind of the season starts to wind down, I definitely don't do it once a week. You know, I probably go to once every two weeks or three weeks, kind of come August, September. Great. And then we had another comment in the chat um, advice for anyone in the South Lake Tahoe area, Advanced Garden Solutions uh, has some fertilizers. 
Second to last question, if I were going to start a container pot for something like potatoes or for really anything, what size pot, um, how much base soil, compost and potting soil should I add? You touched on this a little bit with the, the one third, um, if you were to guess. Um, yeah, I mean, if you get the right potting soil, you know, you can, you know, you don't even necessarily have to add compost, you know, like if you just buy the random bag of soil from like Home Depot, that's like super cheap, like then you're going to want to add like a bunch of compost to that because it's not going to have a lot of that good stuff in it. I always like to spend a little bit extra money and get, you know, the stuff that has the bat guano and the chicken manure and the seaweed. So like there's a huge variety of available nutrients like already in my potting soil. And I tend to add just a little bit of compost just because I know that there's going to be a little bit more available nutrients there. It's going to up my organic matter. And plus like the big bag of compost is usually a little bit cheaper. So it kind of helps distribute that cost a little bit. Um, and like I spent like... I bought a bunch of soil and compost and stuff yesterday. I spent like a hundred bucks at the nursery. So it's easy. It adds up fast. Um, so a, the size container, you know, you can use a five gallon bucket with some holes in the bottom. Like um, the good thing, you can use grow bags. Those are tend to be really cheap and they're like soft sided. Um, I would say, again, you know, I would use two to five gallons would probably two gallons would probably be the smallest. I would try and do like one potato plant. And if you, the bigger you kind of go, the more plants you can kind of fit into it. And Melissa will be able to kind of talk, she'll talk about that with potatoes. Hopefully you're signed up for the potato workshop. <laughs> and um, and it, the other great thing about those workshops, if you just want to sign up and not get the starts, you can sign up and take the class for free. So she's the expert on that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Our last question, are there any community gardens on the South Shore? There are. Um, I'm not an expert on the South Shore because I live in um, Olympic Valley, but um, I know that there's the school garden. Um, I can't remember the name of the place. And there's the, the Heritage Gardens at the Talat Gardens is a community garden. Um, and I don't know, do you know the answer to that at all, Anne? I feel like um, I don't spend a ton of time in Salt Lake. And... Yeah, I am not an expert on this either. I was going to mention the Talak Gardens, um, but I believe they're currently closed and I'm not sure what their status is going to be for the coming summer. Our presenter for our strawberries and tomato workshop is David Long, and he actually lives in South Lake um, and may have the best answer to some of those questions. So we can reach out and try to figure out some of those best locations. I also see some things coming in in the chat. Um, the Lake Tahoe Community Garden, uh, Sierra House School has a geodesic greenhouse. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Um, LTCC has a garden, but not sure if it's a community garden. Um, someone else is saying that Talak is open, so I must be um, not most up to date on that. Um, and then several people were citing the Lake Tahoe Community College. So those might be some good places to check out if you're looking for any um, community gardens or places where you can volunteer or potentially I know um, some community gardens allow you to lease raised beds if you're looking for certain places or a bigger place to garden. But um, we can also consult our South Shore experts in future presentations and share that information. Uh, but that is the last of our questions on the topic of demonstration gardens. Actually, uh, Slow Food Lake Tahoe, as Heather has mentioned, runs the Slow Food Food Bank Garden in Truckee. Uh, UC Davis Turk uh, manages two demonstration gardens, one in Tahoe City um, at our uh, Tahoe City Field Station, as well as in Incline Village outside of the Tahoe Science Center. And then there is the uh, Talak uh, gardens in, uh, closer to the South shore, as well as it seems like there's a lot of different community gardens all around the basin. So we, uh, can do more research on those and be sure to connect everyone with as many people in the community as possible that are sharing the gardening passions. But thank you all so much for sticking with us and allowing us to get through all of those extra questions. I know last year, some people were, um, always sad if we didn't get around to their questions, but I can put up one more time.
um, Heather's email. If you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out to her um, or myself. I don't think I'm going to be the most help, but uh, <laughs> I will be happy to try to find any answers for you as I can. But thank you all so much for joining us for our first presentation, and we hope you all join us for additional sessions uh, as we go through our Grow Your Own High Altitude or High Elevation Gardening series. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.